How do you do? Nice to meet you, Jim. I've never done speed dating, but this looks like the, the Long Now Foundation. It's not quite version. like speed dating. It's a, it's a publicly exposed long speed dating. Yeah. It's all right, don't worry. <laughs> so, um, well, it's lovely to meet you. I, I purposely, um, I've never taken part in one of these long conversations before, but I've witnessed them. And um, I always thought what was interesting about them as a premise was the idea that people didn't know each other at all and met like this. So I purposely didn't find anything out about you, except <coughs> I know from accidentally reading something you're an inventor. And, um, and also that you invented some special lenses. Uh, this is true. So I, I, I am an engineer. Actually, when you said I was one of those kids who took everything apart, yeah. so, so was I. Yeah. I just persisted until I eventually could put it back together. Yeah. That's probably the, the only difference. Yeah. Uh, and well, that's admirable. Uh, it's a peculiar type of OCD, I think. Um, but yeah, so one of the things I, I was very interested in grad school was how do you make, how do you make lenses cheaper for yeah. providing eyeglasses or ophthalmic care in the developing world? And we built a pretty neat machine that uses membranes to cast lenses. So I know a little bit more about you because I went to one of your concerts. Oh, a long player concert or a different type? The Pogues. Oh, one of those. A long time ago, <laughs> yeah. One of those really fast concerts that's over and done with. Well, I'm, I'm, I, just to hark back to lenses, um, it's funny to be actually meeting you because I just was given uh, four boxes of lenses by an optician of uh, a glass, old-fashioned lenses, plastic lenses, glass lenses, all different focal lengths, shapes, and sizes, because um, he learned that I was making a camera obscura. Oh, fabulous. And, and wanted to get involved in you know, helping me out. And um, I, I've been obsessed with a part of this whole long player thing sort of led to wanting to make something that didn't, went on, but didn't need looking after. Are you, are we, we're going in the direction of the long photograph here, I think. <laughs> well, what we're going in the direction of is how do you make something that you don't have to look after? And I figured that you, maybe light is the best thing because just the fundamental laws of physics are such that if you use light, and a pinhole, you're going to get something that will just work. Yes. Yeah. And, um, but the stumbling block was how to get a lens because I thought you needed to get very expensive lenses ground. So you actually don't need any lens for your obscura. You could do it all with pinholes yeah. and then it's perfect. Yeah. But the exposure then is long. Yeah. So. No, well, anyway, to cut a long story short, I did, uh, I did get told that you could just use opticians' lenses. And, but I was interested in making a, a kind of spherical surround vision camera obscura. Not, not one that projected on a table, but a whole immersive one. Um, I w I'd love to help you build that. No, I, I built it. Oh, it's done? Yeah. Where do I see it? Um, well, it, it was in a park in Cheshire, and it will be in a, another park in the south of England from March. It's like inside a, a big stainless steel sphere with a, a lens. If you imagine the equator of the sphere, it's got like a lens every 120 degrees, so three lenses. So they project onto the inside of the sphere and kind of overlap in strange ways and project onto it. So literally you're inside it and you're kind of above the clouds and below the you, water. You literally turn the world inside yeah. out. Yeah. 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 I love that idea. Yeah. I was actually intrigued when Stuart was talking to you, so you've built this instrument that plays a song that you'll never hear. Yeah. I was tr wondering whether you just sped it up and, and listened through it once just to satisfy yourself. <laughs> 
I mean, don't you want to know as an artist that it doesn't screw up at the four millionth bar? No, I mean, that, that's kind of what I like, is that I know how it began, and I know how it ends, because the end's the same as the beginning, because it's a loop. And, and I, I, I like the idea that it's full of surprises. And I know that a lot of those surprises are going to be really unpleasant. Um, and the thing that does sort of concern me is about having these live concerts is that those moments could happen for an entire thousand minutes in public. And I could look like a complete idiot, which possibly I look like anyway, I don't know. But, it's, but, but that's the nature of the thing. But you know. posthumous idiocy is less bad. Is that right? I would, I would think. <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I've always um, resisted any temptation to leap forward into the future and see what it sounds like. But I'm learning to sort of understand what it might sound like by, by experience. You know, the thing about the live thing is you can see where the bits of the score are very explicitly and how they combine. And so I can imagine what might happen when they move in different ways. So it sounds like you're, you're, you're very interested in that. I mean, if you're going to design music that lasts that long, you're, you have to be interested in algorithms. Yes. I'm, I'm explicitly interested in algorithms at the moment yeah. for a different reason. Go on, then. Uh, so Galileo, I th as, as, as I with an amateur version of the history of science would say that Galileo really started it all when he said that we should measure everything that's measurable and, mo and, and uh, make measurable what is not. And I think that was fantastic for science through the last few centuries. We, we, we now understand the large scale of the universe and the very small s scale of structure at, at atomic level and subatomic level because we did single parameter experiments and measured these things. And I think I'm really interested in the long view of science that the, we almost need a statement now that um, rather than measure everything that's measurable, we should model everything that's modelable and make modelable what is not, because we now can compute these things. I think this is a significant transition for science, because it's not just about understanding the physical world up to the present moment, it's about predicting the physical world beyond the, the present moment. And I think it has a lot of interesting uh, ramifications. So I'm, I'm really into modeling everything. And uh, actually, also, again, while you were talking, it made me think of Sol LeWitt's artwork. Like, he was the, uh, uh, he was the first guy to really do it in some yeah. great sense. Like, you can execute his program for a thousand years. Yeah, like the drawings and yeah. structures, yeah. I mean, I pity the interns that have to do it, but they... I don't know. I think it must be great doing that. Thousands of lines. Yeah, I'd like that. It's part of my condition. <laughs> So what, what have you been modeling? Uh, I do a lot of modeling on energy at the moment. So how do you solve the near-term energy problem in the context of carbon? And how do you think about energy further out? So that's an example of modeling the future, I guess. And then some things. I'm modeling a lot of lenses at the moment for solar applications. And then modeling uh, actually steering mechanisms for bicycles, of all things, or tricycles. But what I really like about a, a, this modeling thing, and I think, again, it's a, it, it, could, it could be an interesting extension of science. Right now, I really believe, and, and a friend of mine says it better than me, that every paper that we write or every piece of knowledge we write down should actually be an executable file so that, that you can see everything that the person did. So that the model should be the publication. And I love this, because everything is embedded in that, everything, all of your knowledge and all of your assumptions. And that would be a great way to carry knowledge forward and to build knowledge in a, in a faster, more interesting way than we, we do now, where you publish it. And it's, it's the people who publish these papers do a reasonable job of saying what they did, but it, it's always difficult to really understand everything they knew at that time. So I'm interested in algorithms and modeling for, for this. You're giving me a look like, no, this I is the worst date I've ever been no, on. No, no. <laughs> No, no, actually, it's, it's quite a good date, this, but I'm sorry if I was giving you a look. It's probably because I'm a bit spaced out because I've been up since about half past five and uh, been, on, uh, been deprived of food and nourishment. And, uh, 
No, I was, th I was also probably giving you that look because I was trying to visualize what you're saying and make sure I understood it, which is that um, you're actually making explicit, instead of basically giving someone a, a, a paper that's full of equations and stuff, you're giving them something they can explicitly see. You're giving them the program yeah. to execute all of those equations, yeah. and, and then they can see all the Yeah, they can see what it actually looks like yeah. physically. And they can so. see the garbage or the good stuff that yeah. you put into the equations, and then it would just be more rapid progress, because rather than having to then go and build that own model themselves, they start with yours. I think it would be a lovely way to sort of hand knowledge through. But uh, I mean, yeah, I can, I understand that, but I was just wondering about it must be possible to model lots of things that are actually impossible, physically impossible, and yeah. impossible for the laws of physics, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which I've got nothing against. But um, I just wondered how, you know, how you do the weeding in your system. Oh, well, the people then try, you know, I, th I think many eyes looking at it will say this is impossible and they'll they'll construct a, a good reason. They'll say, you know, you chose the wrong values for gravity and the mass of a neutron, so this is impossible. I think it would be a faster way to improve. Do you, th do you think with your lenses, you could make lenses that um, can kind of compete with radio telescopes for looking back to the beginnings of the universe? Uh, I, I actually read this paper this morning. Uh, you're, you're all going to laugh at me, but it's true. Um, <laughs> so the, the particular way that this machine worked is uh, everyone has seen a, a droplet of water on a leaf. It's a, it's a minimum energy surface, and, and depending upon how you constrain the boundaries of that droplet, so whether it wets the leaf and lies flat or whether it balls up, you can actually change the optical properties of that leaf. You can also do this with a membrane. So the, the, the children's version is you take a, you take a cup, and you, you stretch cling wrap over the top, and then you suck a little bit of air out, and that will make a beautiful lens-shaped surface. And so there are, there are people at NASA and JPL who think about doing this for space telescopes. So rather than launch this enormous heavy, heavy lens or mirror up into space, you launch in fact, a, 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 an inflatable metal, metalized mylar. It's like a thin plastic film with a layer of mirror on it. So you launch this inflatable bag, you inflate it, and then it becomes this perfect lens, and it, and it looks like they will be able to perform just as well or perhaps even better than uh, traditional telescope lenses. But do you think they'll be able to see back like, you know, like these new arrays of radio telescopes that like compound eyes that can <coughs> look back to, you know, the cosmic microwave background. Do you think you c it would be possible to actually... We're way, we're way out of my, my technical... <laughs> oh, sorry, well, <laughs> uh, I mean... Field, but I mean, you, so... Well, I'm probably talking a bit, you know, simplistically and with a vague layman's understanding, but as I understand it, the, you know, if we the Big Bang happened, or if that was the way the universe started, that there's this residual background radiation, right. which started when um, the universe cooled down sufficiently for information to start passing through it. And um, so these new generation of radio telescopes are sort of looking back at the CMB and, you know, well, back towards that to pick out, you know, the earliest sort of clouds of gas forming into stars and stuff like that. I just wondered if it would ever be possible to make an optical telescope, in your opinion, that could do that. So you can't look beyond the speed of light. So that there is a boundary of the universe that you can see. This is my, this is my high school physics. Yeah, but surely a radio telescope. So, so, so he is, I think maybe to answer the question, the the, the you can you always want to make a bigger and bigger lens yeah. to see further back, to increase the, the, the sort of resolution that you can see back. And this is a way to make increasingly big lenses with less material. It's also the reason we make a lot of these as arrays of telescopes now. So you don't, you know, it's, it's a little hard to make a single mirror that's two miles 
yeah. in diameter. Yeah. So they use lots of little yeah. ones like a Fresnel lens, which was originally developed for, by the French for lighthouses. Yeah. And then you add up all those little pieces. Yeah. This, this would be a way potentially to make cheap versions of that. Uh, in fact, some of those um, that I, I, I really care about energy, they're, they're actually retiring some of these solar plants that are lots and lots and lots of mirrors yeah. to be used for astronomical observation now. So when the, the, these were built in the 70s to, to test ideas in solar energy, and now they're useful for space science, which I think is nice. I agree. Um, I, I'm obsessed. I think we need to, we need to solve our energy problems here in the near term, so that we can what, get what's out there. Your, um, what do you think could do that? Uh, there's certainly a lot of solar energy. There's a lot of wind energy. You could do it for a while on nuclear power, um, but nuclear is the 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 materials that you would use. Uh, there's only a limited amount, so. It'll probably last a thousand years, but probably not a lot further. Uh, fusion will give us a, l a little bit more than that, but uh, but at the moment, I think you know fusion is still unproven. So we're going to be stuck with solar and uh, and and the the subsidiaries of solar like wind and and uh, biofuels. I, I once went to a, a, a talk by an economist called um, I think it's called Jeremy Rifkind. And he was talking about hydrogen fuel cells. I consciously don't go to talks with with economists. Yeah. Well, I, I went to this talk for whatever reasons. And it, yeah, I'm sorry. It was sorry, very fascinating yeah. to me because he was talking about um, uh, energy revolutions following or happening at the same time as communications revolutions. Right. And so he was talking about you know the the internet as being this. Uh, communication revolution of you know decentralized network communication and cell phones too, and um, waiting for the the energy revolution that would go with it. And he was talking about um, hydrogen fuel cells in the context of they would be a decentralized form of energy. They're act. They're yeah. So they're yeah. He's but got to be careful. This is why I don't go to talks with yeah. economists. It's a battery, not a energy source. Like you have to produce the hydrogen some other way. Yeah, no, he did, he did sort Thankful. of say that was the snag, <laughs> that, you know, hydrogen doesn't grow on trees sort of thing, that you have to, you know, have to crack the hydrogen out of something else. But, <clears throat> I mean, he, he, it was a persuasive and interesting idea, and, you know, he gave lots of examples that made it sound like something would, one would like to see, but then I've always been surprised that never really heard much about it since then. Yeah, it's definitely the holy grail, is the distributed energy source. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, in my life, I actually looked at this in detail, and if I covered my whole, every piece of land that I own in my life, and it was producing hydrogen perfectly, it still wouldn't cover the amount of energy that I use. So I'm a little worried that that's a sort of my mission at the moment is what what is the limits what is a reasonable amount of energy for each person on the planet and in the context of carbon and these other things how do you how do you live the highest quality of life at, at per unit of energy so it actually makes the energy climate change conversation sort of an aesthetic one how do you, you know it's, it's like how do we get the most out of what we know is finite well you'll have to carry that on with the next person i'm afraid <laughs> anyway it's been uh, lovely talking to you you too Cheers.